everybody, this is Casey Newbold Kerr from uh, Sono Muerto, and uh, I am privileged, privileged to be here with from out of this world and, of course, Europe, Key Marcelo. Uh, how are you doing today, man? Great. How are you doing, mate? I can't complain. I'm doing pretty good. I'm talking to you. And so, um, uh, for the, yeah, for, as I said, for those who, who aren't aware, Key rose to prominence playing with Europe uh, ha- and has had a storied, storied musical career that hopefully we can cover in uh, some detail in the time that we have. And so I just wanted to jump right into into things and just ask how and when did you start playing guitar? It was in, it was in uh, in my teens. I was thirteen. Yeah. Uh, it was it was actually me and a friend of mine, and we were you know just playing around with t- tennis rack- rackets. You know, I come from the country <laughs> of Bjorn Borg after all, and we turned them around and you know pretended they were guitars like that. So there and then the idea to form a band started. Yeah. And we made a pact that we're going to go back to our parents' house and say that we wanted electric guitars because we were going to form a band. And I was yeah. maybe 12. And it turns out I had the superior strategy because he got a, you know, a no, a point blank no in his face. But I went home to my mom and said, listen, mom, Life is not worth living without an electric guitar. And this kind of strategy is is great with teen parents because you get this little baby that grows up too fast and has a million zits and looks like shit. (laughs) And then you don't want want this freak to be suicidal as well. (laughs) So when Christmas came, it was a big uh, Christmas gift down to the, uh, the, the Christmas tree. I knew it wasn't a football. It was long and stuff. And I opened it up. It wasn't like the end of the Could have been a surfboard. The, yeah. the room was filled <laughs> up with light. Yeah. My first electric guitar. And that was it. It was a love affair that started there and then and it hasn't ended. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think, uh, you know, as a guitarist myself, uh, there is something about the electric guitar that if you love rock music, you kind of romanticize it. There is something about the electric guitar that, I don't know. It's magical. Absolutely. And it's I, absolutely magical. Just a thought of it, you, you know, brings you to a, a better place. <laughs> I, I'm still that way. I'm honestly, I'm still that way. And yeah. so, uh, as you, as you learn to play, you know, who, who were some of the, the guitarists that really, that inspired you or, or drove you to play? Obviously, um, growing up in the seventies, Richard Blackmore from the, from Deep Purple was, yeah. was, God, in a way, because he he came up with all those riffs, amazing guitar riffs. Yeah. It was like a riff master. But I, I love like Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck in those almost a little bit of a generation before him. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, th- th- things moved so fast back then as well, you know, so you it, could, yeah. you could move from, I mean, you know, you had the start of rock and roll in say 55, 56, then you had a year later, Buddy Holly innovating. You had a few yeah. kind of quiet years around say f- from 59 to maybe 62, early 63, the Beatles came along. That, that is not a lot of time, you know, and then I you've know. got the Who smashing their instruments. And before you know it, you've got Black Sabbath and then you've got people like Blackmore coming in. It, it's, it's, crazy to look back at it is crazy to look back at and it was really like a revolution the revolution of the electric guitar and it changed a lot i mean the change definitely changed the, the face of how we picture rock music first of all uh, i mean it was a wonderful time to pick up the guitar and if you can, can imagine all the things that happened it was very inspiring and one of the one of the reasons I kept going was new stuff kept ha- happening, like you mentioned, all the time. You know, it was always something new to get into. And also, I was being really stubborn. A lot of my friends that started playing the electric guitar, they gave up after about a year or two, you know. But, but I just kept going, you know. I think that's part of the secret for anyone who wants to have a career in music is to be very stubborn. Growing up on, on those those artists that we just, we spoke about, uh, what interests yeah. me really is uh, that, you know, you're a, you're a very melodic guitarist, but you're also, let's not deny it. You, you're a very technical player. Where did that come from? Was that just an extension of Rich, Richie Blackmore or what, what got you to that point? No, that was actually the seventies fusion, you know, John McLaughlin and Al okay. Demiola. Yeah. And I mean, Al Demiola is 
still just an unbelievable alternate picking master. He's one of yeah. the top ever, I, I would guess, you know. He just, he's one of the, the original developers of the alternate picking thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, his early albums, it was just mind blowing how fast he could do that. And that, that was what made me want to start to do alternate picking by listening to Alden Miola. Although John McLaughlin had, John McLaughlin in in, in the Mahavishnu Orchestra, he has a different, slightly different picking style, but also very interesting. So there were some really technical players around. Uh, and also a guy called Oli Halsell. You may not have heard of him. You, you should look him up. He was in a British band, 70s band called Pato, P-A-T-T-O. Yeah, okay, yeah. And he, he, he died way too young in the 90s, um, back in the days when people thought heroin was okay as long as you, you just smoked it. Not so. Uh, yeah, uh, and he died in, in the, the mid-90s. But he was just amazing. And he, I think he inspired people like Ed Van Halen as well because already 71, he's doing some unbelievable legato stuff, which... I'm sure inspired Alan Holdsworth and then players like that as well. Which he, in turn, yeah, Holdsworth inspired Eddie. And, yeah. you know, we start going down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Absolutely. that That's the way it goes. So, so it was a lot of really interesting players around 71, I would say, 71 to 73, that changed the guitar playing entirely. And they weren't, right then, they were not in the mainstream music area. They were in jazz and fusion. You had to dig a little deeper. Yeah, you had to dig a little bit deeper. When you dig a little deeper, you get rewarded, which is cool. It is. Yeah, it is rewarding. That's what I've always found, at least, you know. That's what I've always found. But, um, okay, so moving forward a little into your actual music career, there's a song I want to bring up, and I think you might know what it is. Uh, it's a little, con- it's a contentious issue with you, I'm sure, but I mean, I always don't have to name it, do I? Really? Let's face it. Superstitious. It was. It's we go rocking. Oh, we go rocking. Now, of course, man. Now you surprised me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, and obviously, there's a story that goes with that that came oh, a little yeah. later. And by the way, just. Full disclosure, yeah. I have listened to oh, both songs. So funny. I've I listened mean, to both songs in, in question, and if it went to trial, <laughs> if I was the judge, you win. <laughs> yeah. Come on, come on. But sorry. Yeah. But, but I tell you, mate, the, the, the story is even more ridiculous than that. The thing is, I, I got to uh, speak to Rick Browdy. Rick Browdy produced... Poison's album, which that their version is on, so to speak. Yeah. And he, when they record the album, as a producer, he he brought with him the Easy Action, al- Easy Action album with Wigga Rockin' on it and yep. uh, a Hanoi Rocks album because these were the, uh, the, dude, the, the, the I, top I, bands. Yeah, I love Hanoi. And he played, he played uh, Wigga Rockin' to the band and suggested they made a cover of it because he loved the song. And they... Which they said, did. Only a fucking band from Sweden. Let's rip it off. Who's gonna know? Yeah, well, <laughs> this is uh, Rick Browdy's own words. So it, it's a no-brainer. They took it, you know. Yeah. Although they don't admit it to this day. Do you know that? To this day, they completely deny it. You know. <laughs> hey, the proof. The proof is there, as far as I'm concerned. You know, use your ears. So too. Right, so really quick, because I, I really, I do want to get to this new record because I'm really excited about it. Uh, I've listened to it a bunch sure. of times. So just I, I have pretty much, um, I kind of have two questions just about Europe. So effectively, um, when you had the opportunity to join Europe, was that a call that was placed to you or was was there an audition? No, it was actually, no, there was no audition at all. I mean, okay. the thing is, what led up to that thing, I guess, was that me and Joe Tempest got to work before I joined Europe. Oh, that's right. Here. Yes, yes, yes. Swedish Metal Aid. There's actually a documentary coming out on, on television or on Netflix as well, I think, in December about oh, the cool. recording of food and an interview me for that. And, and Tempest as well. And uh, Tom and Nielsen, the singer of the Easy Action. You know, so we got to work together and that worked out really well. So I think that was a, a big reason not to brag or anything, but the two top players in Sweden back then was was me and, and Norm, you know. So yeah. when he got the sack, they called me. You know, it was very natural. Easy. And then so well, I- Ingrid, Ingrid's also a good player, but he wasn't living in Sweden even then. He moved really early to America, to America first to yeah. LA and now 
still in Miami. Yeah. And so, I mean, uh, the, sorry, last, last question about, uh, about Europe in the early years, once you, once you uh, got in the band joining, it's such a unique time, you know, when they're about to explode and they've got these monster songs. How, how did you sort of view your position in terms of learning those songs? Was it, okay, I'm going to nail this note for note, or I'm going to put my, I'm going to get it, but put my own spin on things. Did you, did you face any challenges from that perspective? Yeah. I mean, first I was playing around there with the idea of doing um, completely different versions, but then I asked myself, what do I want to hear when I see a band live? Yeah. I want to hear recognition and the thing yeah. is, I'm all about melody. I'm, I, I like thematic solos. I always did from the get-go. And what I, from when I started to now, I, I do pretty much the same thing. I'm playing the same solo. It's, it's, a, it's a theme surrounded by technical stuff and, and you know, uh, enhancing the melodic, the, the melodic parts of the solo. That's what I try Beautiful. to accomplish. Yeah. So I really wanted to keep the good parts, you know. And, and then obviously when you do like fast runs, like uh, uh, pentatonic stuff, I did my own version of that, obviously. But yeah. I, really, I really wanted to nail uh, the final count on solo exactly like it was because I know that I would have wanted to hear that solo and not another solo, yeah. you know. So, so definitely I went for doing uh, all the melodic parts right. And the, but for some reason, when I play them, they become me, you know. So just even and, if I'm and playing, that's, yeah, that's how you have to do it to make it feel yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that, absolutely. And I personally, I, I, I had this experience when I, I I went to see a band, and there's a new guitar player. And he doesn't play the real solos, and yeah, I yeah. hate that because then it's almost like a anticlimax. Yeah, like, wait, you you at what? least need the key licks at the very least. Yeah. You need those ones you can hum, and then there's yes. kind of um, there's punctuation in between. It's almost like a a sentence. You've got words, and then you've got punctuation, and so the key licks are the words, and your little yes. maybe quick pentatonic runs are the punctuation. You can kind of get away with those. That's, that's what a I good found, description. Exactly like exactly like that. That's, that's how I, I learned so. <laughs> but uh, the new record, man, I um. I am blown away and oh great thanks I, I, and I say that with the, the greatest of sincerity but I've got to admit to you that when we get these kind of uh the interview email the pre-release um version of the album it specifically says don't share it with anyone now I haven't but I may have had a technical violation because I was driving earlier and um <laughs> lighting up my dark came on this is the I think the third time or fourth time probably actually I'd heard the album and after the second chorus I did this. I put my finger up and I pressed a button and opened the sunroof. And so there may be a few people in my town who have heard that song now because, <laughs> but that to me, that is the greatest endorsement I can give a song is the last song I did that too. I tell you with, again, the greatest of sincerity was Thunder Road by Bruce Springsteen. I was driving home from work one night. I'd actually had a great day and I was like, yeah, that's it. And I was five minutes from home. I knew that song went for five minutes. And so again, I reached up and I pressed that button and <laughs> off I went. So that that's, I've just revealed my favorite song, but I have to say, if, the, if if the song makes you want to do that, that's in in itself is a great compliment. Yeah, uh, and I wanted awesome. to tell you that, uh, and I want people to understand um, that this record is full of great songs like that. The single is hanging on. Uh, how did you come to choose? You know, for, for an AOR record where every song, kind of the way AOR works, is every song could kind of be a single. How did you come to choose a single? I'm not sure we viewed it as a single, as per se, but we wanted to have something that represented the band, the feeling of the band, the great musicians, and something where Darby can play away, where I can play away, where Tommy can sing his ass off, where we have the, the signature background vocals and, and, the, and the, the keyboard arrangements and all that. Uh, and we figured that that's... The song, and also it's kind of cool to start with an up tempo song, the first thing you ever pre present of a band, because yeah. people, you know, you never start with a ballad. You don't want to start, yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely, song. yeah, yeah, you want to have an up tempo one up, up front there. So it was an easy choice. I mean, both the label and us felt the same way about it, and, and it still has a really catchy chorus, you know. You're one of those that, you, you know, you, you want to get rid of after about three hours when you're vacuum cleaning and it's still there. <laughs> yes. But, 
<laughs> yeah. Infectious. Well, those, uh, yeah. But but the, the thing is, one thing we strived for recording this album was to get 10 really top quality songs going yep. uh, and not to settle for fillers. With nowadays, it's, 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 it's a well-known disease the past decades that a lot of bands, they, they have like, two good songs and the rest is fillers. Yeah, yeah. And I think part of that is kind of the, what you what you might call the streaming or the Spotify age where people just cherry pick songs. And I love albums. Exactly. And, and you had, um, you know, you had a lot of great talent on this. And, you know, uh, I love the fact that you had Ron Nevison on board because he engineered my favourite rock album of all time, Quadrophenia, and just went on then to work with so many great artists. And uh, oh, there's another, actually, another song that I wanted to ask you about is, and it's probably not one that you yeah, think... Just- can I say something about Ron Nelson first? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's such a trick to work with him again. I mean, he obviously produced the, the Europe album from 1988. But, and, yeah. Uh, but it was so great to have him mix this because we had a couple of uh, modern mixed guys having a try at it, and, and I didn't like it at all. I yeah. wanted the organic thinking that, that Ron always includes his mixes. I mean, it's ups and downs, lights and shadows. Yeah. Nowadays, people just compress the shit out of everything. So it's like a yes. flatlining turd if you watch the audio file. Dynamics are everything. That. Yeah, the dynamics are gone. And personally, I'm not interested in hearing what the lead singer had for breakfast. I want to hear <laughs> yeah. I want to hear the ups and downs, you know? And yeah. So And Tommy said, well, you know, Ron, give him a call. Called Ron. He said, hey, motherfucker. And uh, I said, uh, I have this project. It's right up your alley. Uh, and I told him about the situation where I had a couple of guys trying it out. And he said, what? Dropbox me the files for one song of your preference. I'll send you a mix tomorrow. And you get to choose the other guys or me. And of course, he sent us a mix that, mix that completely blew our minds. You know, yeah. blew them clean off. You know, amazing. He did Twilight in a way exactly like I pictured it. So there was no question. And that's a it. that's a big song too. That's yeah. a, that you know what that, that's an epic that doesn't necessarily feel like an epic because it often when a song goes, I mean, I think that goes about seven and a half seven minutes. minutes something. Something. It yeah. doesn't feel that way. And no. only, so only certain songs can pull that off. You know, not every song can be a free bird or a won't get fooled again or you know, right. Or a twilight, perhaps. Hey, let's see what happens with it. But that song is just, it's a journey and it's, that's so much fun. But, Thanks a lot. Great. Hey man, this is all sincere. And, you know, talking about Quarterfinia, I have to tell you this, we were, uh, and this was so cool. The last week of the mixes, I was actually hooked up uh, with a streaming service that is, mm-hmm. I didn't, I had no idea it was available. So I was sitting in my studio here in Gothenburg and I saw Ron, in the state of Washington, in his studio, real time. That's cool. Uh, video, audio, and his engineer who was in, who lives in Portland, Oregon, in his studio, audio and video live. And I saw Ron Nevison move the background vocals up to dB in the pre-chorus and take them down and hear it simultaneously. That's awesome, man. man. The future is here. It's so cool. Yeah. And while we were at it, of course, we had a cup of coffee in between mixes and all that. And, and he told amazing stories, you know. And I'm talking about the who, he told me this story because we we were struggling with the end of it, lighting up my dark, because it ends in a place yeah. where it's like chaos. It's a guitar solo, Tom is very is background vocals, synthesizers, you know, a lot of things happening. And I said, should we clean this up, Ron? It's like complete chaos. And he listened back to it a couple of times and said, no, nah, I agree it's chaos, but it's good chaos. And then he gave me this, the Who story. They were having a problem recording a Who, the Who song. I don't know if it was for Portofino, but some mm-hmm. Who recording he did. And it was at the end of the song, and they couldn't make the end make sense. And Roger went in and put on harmonies, loads of harmonies, and they put on some keyboards and some effects. It just made it worse. It was just horrible. And then uh, Townsend, who had been in the background the whole time, he asked Ron, can I have a go? <laughs> yeah. And Ron said, yeah, sure, be my guest. And he went into the studio, and nobody saw that he brought a baseball bat with him. 
And he oh, completely man. demolished everything in the studio. <laughs> yes. The grand piano, the drums, the windows, everything on the walls, all the furniture, he demo- t- demolished it. And it was all recorded. <laughs> yes. And they kept it. Everybody went, that's it! And we got it! It's a wrap! <laughs> And I'm sure Keith Moon was the first one to be like, yeah, man, that was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> man, that is so cool. That That's the essence of rock and roll, is it not? But, it is. Um, but so the other song, that's such a cool story. Um, the other song I, I really wanted to ask you about, it's probably not the, not one of the ones you'd be thinking of, but The Warrior, and I've got The Ultimate Warrior behind me here, but um, wow. the, yeah, I see it. The, the Warrior, um, you know, I feel a real, at least at the very, very start and in the groove, the double bass shuffle, but um, in the start, I almost feel an Eddie Van Halen homage, like the start of oh, yeah. off um, Women and Children First, you know, the, the bend and the tap. I could be way off, right. but listening to it, no, I no, went, oh, I get it, I get it. It's, it's not a, it actually, it wasn't really meant as an, a Van Halen. It was, I mean, it's very timely and all that, but, but it's so sad yeah. that he passed away, oh, by the way. man. I, way I, there's a picture <laughs> behind me there, but I, I didn't I didn't leave my, my bed, my bedroom, really, not my bed, but for two days. That's I was so time. hurt by losing Eddie. I mean, yeah. he, he changed my life. Absolutely it, horrible. But I think the story about the song is that, I mean, that, that Alex Van Halen room, which it, which it is now, but it was it actually is, yeah. originally a Billy Cobham group yeah. from 1973 on the Spectrum yes. album. You know? Absolutely. And, that's what it and, and the Alex picked it up and they did amazing, he did amazing stuff with it. But the story is, you know, Darby Todd and Ken Sandin are all also in my solo band, in Kim Marcello band. Mm-hmm. So during sound checks, there's always a point at sound check when the from the house guys go, he will go, Guys, play something all of all you know when at the end of the song. Yeah. So he would always do that groove. And I came up with that riff. And and we would just jam on that for as long as we could before they told us to fuck off. But <laughs> yeah. the thing was, after one of those sound checks, uh Darby said, Why don't you make a song out of this? That's a great riff. Make, you know, right. All you need is a verse and a chorus, and we're there. I mean, the groove is amazing. So, so that's what I did, and it turned out amazing. And I tried to stay away from the tapping because I, sus- I suspect that it's going to be very Van Halen-ish. So there's no it all, Yeah, it always is, yeah. But, but if you listen, if you do your homework and listen to Ole Halsell in Pato, you will hear a lot of Ole Halsell in, my, in the techniques I'm using here and and the almost fusion-y way I take off sometimes. It's... I'm so yeah, inspired. No, no, no. I, I, I totally, I, I got that. It, uh, there was so many other things that I heard there, but I just sort of wanted to just point out that intro. And then that led yeah. into the, yeah, I heard the intro and went, oh man. And then the song's like, whoa. But uh, yeah. But I have just... no problem in, in making it, you know, and it becoming a homage to Van Halen because they deserve it and he deserves it, Eddie. What a great, the amazing king. player. You know, the, he changed the game forever. And, Absolutely. Uh, Moving forward, what do you uh, where, where, where do you see this band going? Because I, I think that AOR fans, honestly, man, are going to love this record, and AOR fans are loyal. So, are you going to be touring on this? Oh, absolutely! Now yeah, that you no can, doubt about it. yes. I mean, whenever COVID, the COVID regulations started to start to lighten up, we can definitely go on the road. I mean, my dream right now, my dream is. Everything, for everything to open up so we can do the big festivals in the EU. We want to yeah. go to Japan. I mean, we were number one in Japan. I heard we're that, yeah. Yeah, so it's, we're, we're really, it's a no-brainer to go to Japan. And while we're in Japan, why not go to Australia? Okay, go that's what I was going to say. It's the logical next step. It's the logical and, next step. And, and I and would kill there, to go to Australia. And we would love to have you. There is actually a reasonably good AOR scene down here. And I've got to give a shout out to my buddies in White Widow because they kind of fly the flag down here. But uh, yeah, there are crowds that that will see you for sure, man. So get on that. But beyond that, you know, I'm really excited for people to hear the record. The record. January 14th. I was going to, I just had to check. I I was like, I think it's the 14th. Yeah. So January 14th, this thing's going to come out. And what's really cool, what I really like is that uh, you're doing a double record so you've got a yes. bunch of demos and a live like almost like a live ep kind of record thing going yeah. as well yeah it's awesome and it, it's from the first festival and only so far we did with this lineup 
Yeah. Wait, whoa, whoa, that was the first. Hang on a second. That was because I've heard this. That was the first show. I know. Oh this man. Was that and was that was like listening to a studio album, but with more energy. And it was absolutely crazy. The thing is, when we met up before playing in, at this festival in Ludwigsburg in Germany, we mm-hmm. met up in Gothenburg, where I where I reside in Gothenburg, Sweden. Yeah, we flew in. Tommy from Berlin in Germany and Darby from London, England, and we were in the studio rehearsing. I mean, we nailed the the set the first the first run through. So yeah. after three or four times, we were like. Man, we got this in the can. What would what are we gonna do now? And we have one more full day of the studio time. So I said, "Listen, guys, I have three demos, three uh, MP3s. Let's listen to them. Maybe we can record some new music." And it was yeah. Twilight, lighting up my dark, and in a million years. And before the end of the Great second songs. day, we had th- yeah, we had three finished backgrounds for those three songs and those were the first three ones we we start you know finished off and showed to people started showing to people so we got off to a great start you know yeah well and, and it's been like it's been like this since then it's so effortless everybody knows they're part of the band so when we play live it's not like you're interrupting each other which has easily happened with lead vocalists and guitar players we know exactly our when we went to come and go. And if you think about it, in a hard rock band, the dialogue between the lead vocalist and the guitar player, it's like the dynamics of it all. They, they answer oh, each other. I've experienced that. I see that in bands and in my own band, like I get it. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah, though, it and obviously I've focused on the guitar quite a lot here, but the vocals on this, this record are just out of this world, man. They're so good. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Obviously it's awesome. no, no pun intended, but, Kind of, because yeah. they are, they're outstanding. And I love, I love great high and powerful raspy vocals. And this thing just delivers in spades. So I want to thank you so much, Key, for this chat. This has been so cool. And that who awesome. story, oh man, this has been such a great chat. And we would love to see you in Australia. If you can try to make that happen, people will come. I will make them come. <laughs> I will tell them, awesome. see the show. But the, the record is, uh, the band is out of this world. The record is out of this world. It comes out uh, January 14 on Atomic Fire. It's got a bunch of bonus tracks. It's got a live EP. It's just fantastic. So if you love great melodic rock, AOR, great guitar playing and vocals you have to you have to get on this so uh get get on board people because this is super super cool and i love it but uh keith thank you so much i really appreciate your time thank you thank you mate i hope you to see you over a beer in australia when we get oh there. that must happen we have to Absolutely. that means you have to tour you have to come here now yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no seriously awesome. man thank you so much is it perhaps hmm. your, um, your um, echo cancellation settings? Because I'm here.